change the thing you ever thought or did or anything else. But all we can do is try to help you. And uh, today I entitled this sermon, Something to Worry About. Now, um, if you're in this place and you've heard the gospel and you've received the free gift of salvation, you don't ever have to worry about your salvation. I don't care who tells you otherwise. There are several scriptures in the Bible that talks about a person losing their salvation. Listen, these people that teach that, all of them aren't crazy. But those scriptures aren't to you in this age. It was real easy in the Old Testament to lose your salvation. Real easy. It will be real extremely easy in the tribulation to give up and lose your salvation. But in this dispensation of grace, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you couldn't lose your salvation if you wanted to. Your salvation is not based on anything you do or don't do. But the problem is, there's two ditches in every road. People get off in this one ditch. Well, if I don't have to worry about losing it, why live for Jesus? And then people get over in this other ditch, and every moment of the day, they're afraid they lost it. Our heart today is to help you. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. I've showed you this before, but it's been two or three days, and I forget quickly, as you know. And he gave some apostles. Do you know Jesus Christ gave apostles to the church in the early church? Those signs and wonders in the Bible are called the gifts of the apostles. Now, are there apostles today? No. The word apostle means sent one and a person who saw the resurrection, uh, glorified fleshly body of Jesus. Now, I don't care if you call yourself an apostle. You can call a horse's tail a leg all day long. It ain't a leg. Watch. He gave some apostles. He gave some prophets. Do you know every Old Testament prophet the Jewish people killed? It's tough business being a prophet. Are there prophets today? Now Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, In sundry time God spoke in a lot of different ways, but to now He's spoken in one way, and that's through His Son. Do you need a prophet? No. He left you a book. In the New Testament, to prophesy means to declare the word of God, okay? So at some time, you know, he gave apostles, he gave prophets, and some evangelists, and we still have evangelists today, and some pastors. Now, he gave these as gifts, pastors and teachers. So I've said this before, hey, will you like it or not, I'm your gift. <laughs> now, I know some of you would like to exchange your gift, uh, but I'm your gift, and so some people, they figure it out, I'm not going anywhere, so they go somewhere else and try to get a different gift. But I'm your gift, I'm your pastor, I'm your teacher. For what? What for? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now my primary job is not picking weeds. My primary job is not mowing the grass here. My primary job is to help mature you to where you are working in the ministry and that ministry would be edifying the rest of your brothers and sisters. I'm going to read it for you again. What for? The perfecting, which means maturing, growing up of the saints. For what? The work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. So each and every one of you need to be edifying the body of Christ. And my responsibility to help you to see how to do that. So, that's my job. To help you mature into becoming a great minister. Now, last week we looked at all the things that happened when we were born again. Does anybody remember any of them? Just shout it out. Now, don't shout me down. Let me see if it's on here. Justification's on here. Propitiation. Sanctification. Is she reading her notes? 
Oh, I meant for memory. So we talked about all those things, and of course they end in glorification, and that's what we're all looking for. But you don't get it all now. And uh, I thought the prayer that Donnie prayed was beautiful. And one day we're all going to be given a glorified body. But look around the room. You don't get it now. Now there are people that would tell you you can have it now. I don't believe that. So if you're born again, born of God's seed, you can't lose your birth. You're going to be God's child no matter what because you were born of uncorruptible seed. And there's a part of you, your spirit and your soul, that God cut away from your flesh. Your flesh was born of corruptible seed. It was your mom and daddy that brought you into this world. But your eternal part, your spirit, God cut away Colossians 2 at the moment that you received the free gift of salvation. You can't be restuck to your flesh. You can't be unborn. Just like you can't be unborn in the flesh. Jesus told a man in John chapter 3, you must be born again. There wasn't any way for Nicodemus to be born again at that point. But after the resurrection, there was. So if you've been born of God's seed, that's incorruptible seed. You can't ever go back on it. You can, you can do whatever you want. That won't change who your father is. Now, I've got a couple of boys. You guys mostly know the story. One of them I celebrate, one I don't. That don't mean that they're not both my boys. I, now, I'm not talking about you. I know all your kids are perfect, but some of you in here relate. You might have had a child that didn't always do what maybe they should have, but that didn't mean they weren't your child. Sometimes you might be in a situation where you break off fellowship. I had my son arrested three times for trespassing. But it was my son sitting in the county jail. But I had broken my fellowship because I was not going to tolerate the behavior. Same thing with God. God will break off fellowship with you, but you're still his. What will he do? He'll punish you. I thought it would punish him to put him in the Osage County Jail. When I went to pick him up, the one time he said, man, they got the best cinnamon rolls. I just almost, I almost stopped and told him to get out because I knew then they wasn't no helping him. But don't believe the lie that you can be a child of God, then you're not according to what you did or didn't do or whatever. You're a child of God. And you don't have to worry about that. But there are some things to worry about. I want to give you some things to worry about today. Remember when your mama used to give you a spanking and you started crying and she said, you better shut up crying or I'll give you something to cry about. I want to give you something to worry about today. But don't worry about your salvation. Look at 2 John verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and, of course, an antichrist, right? Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. So I want to give you some things today that after you're born again, you can lose. You cannot, I want to say it again, you cannot lose your salvation. But at the judgment seat of Christ, you can lose. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. I hope you don't mind. We have several scriptures today. I don't want you to think this is my ideal. For every man's work shall be made manifest. For every man's work, who's he talking to? Christians in a church in a town called Corinth. Every man's work shall be made manifest. Where? At the judgment seat of Christ. Not the great white throne judgment. That's a thousand and some odd years later. Every man's work shall be made manifest. Am I supposed to work? Yeah, not for your salvation. But you should work because of your salvation. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says work out your salvation. Not work for your salvation. You work out what God's worked in. Watch it. 
Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. What day? The great uh, judgment seat of Christ, because it shall be revealed by fire. Everything you've ever done or didn't do is going to be burned up. Whatever lasts is a reward. Whatever is burned up, you lost. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. You're going to have an opportunity to suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved. It doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you're saved or not. It's talking about your reward. Yet so as by fire. So you can be saved as of by fire, but have no reward. Look at Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, let me tell you the first thing you can lose is your assurance. I get it almost every week from somebody in my life or affiliated with this church. They've lost their assurance that they're saved. You can lose it. You lose it because you've strayed from God. And you're just not sure that God could love somebody like you. And it's understandable. Because let's just get to it. You're a pretty sorry person just like me. And the closer you get to God, the holier He seems. And when the holier He seems the more rotten we seem. And maybe you got some false teacher telling you, well, you know, if you do that, uh, you've lost your salvation. No, you can lose your assurance. You can worry about that. Most of the time, these people are listening to a false teacher, either on the radio or TV, or they have a friend or... Uh, they're sneaking off and going to different church services. And they're teaching them that, you know, they've lost their salvation. They're just not really saved. They say things like this to me. I just don't feel saved anymore. Well, you're not saved by your feelings. They say, I, I just don't have goosebumps anymore. Well, you're not saved by goosebumps. I haven't been slain in the spirit in a while. Someone told them they weren't baptized right. You know, there are several churches here in Barsville, and they have a whole ministry of rebaptizing people because they teach them and tell them, well, you're not fully saved yet. You're not fully born again yet because you were not baptized correctly. And they rebaptize born again believing baptized people. And they have whole ministries for it. Listen, you ain't going to leave Matoka and go to the Catholic Church and they accept your uh, Matoka baptism. They will rebaptize you. You're not going to leave Matoka and go to a oneless church of God and they accept your salvation. They will tell you, you were baptized wrong. You have not fully been saved. You have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then when you go through that hoop, they'll say, well, until you speak in tongues, you're not completely saved. Most of these people that lose their uh, assurance, they've been dealing with false teachers. Some people will tell them, well, you're in the wrong church. I've never had a person tell me, I've been in the Word of God for hours and, and I've been praying for hours and I'm just not sure if I'm born again. Those people have strayed from God or they've been listening to wrong teaching. Look at John 5, 24. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is Jesus, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is past, that's past tense, from death unto life. 
Always give them that verse. Have you believed on Jesus Christ? Yeah. Are you trusting in his blood to save you? Yeah. Well, then you're saved. Well, yeah, but. I don't want to hear no but. You can yeah, but all day long. Have you believed on Jesus Christ? Yeah. Well, you, then you will not come into condemnation. You have in the past already passed from death to life. You know what Paul said about a born again believer? We're seated with him right now in heavenly places. You say, well, how's that? Oh, I can't explain it. Can you explain it? I can't explain it. But I know this, every born again believer here, you might be sitting in that seat, but if you close your eyes and start to pray to God, you're at the throne room of heaven spiritually. So one thing that you can lose if you mess around is your assurance. Your assurance of salvation. Two, you can lose your testimony. You can lose your testimony to the people around you. Your testimony is people know you believe that what you say you believe. If you mess up and people see it, you will lose your testimony to them. How many of you remember Keith Williams? Keith Williams and his wife used to come to church here and they just they got so feeble that they they couldn't and Keith Williams told me, he was a crotchety old man, he told me that they were going to Barsville Southern one time, and Barsville Southern had a revival. And so Keith said, I went back to Phillips, and I began to invite my co-workers to come to the revival with me, like the preacher asked me to do. Keith Williams said, one of his co-workers said, I hear you talking, Keith, but I can't understand you because your life speaks louder than your invitation. So you know what Keith told me? He said, so I don't invite people to come to church. I said, Keith, that's not the lesson you should have learned in that. He said, I know, but I just don't invite people. Because he didn't have any testimony. Let me show you how this works. So Peter hung out at the trial of Jesus. Peter watched the scourging. He listened to the trial, but he tried to blend in the crowd. And you know, he denied the Lord three times before the cock crew and all that stuff. Well, one time, he's warming himself by a fire. And the Bible says a little girl came up to him and said, Didn't I see you with Jesus? Now, you can get a lot of things from this little story. That little girl must have been following Jesus. Must have had parents or something that had brought her to some of the things that Jesus had done. Maybe she had been there when he fed 5,000. Maybe she had been there in the stories we read this morning where he healed the widow of Nain's uh, son, raised him from the dead. Who knows? But this little girl recognized Peter. She said, wasn't well, you one of his disciples? And he said, no, I'm not. She said, I'm pretty sure you are because your speech betrays you. And so he cussed at her to prove that he wasn't a follower of Jesus. Now, 50 days later at Pentecost, when Peter stood up to preach, I wonder if she was in that crowd. Very possibly could have been in that crowd you know what the bible says the bible says that after peter preached three thousand people came to know the lord but maybe if peter hadn't lost his testimony it would have been three thousand and one did that little girl ever come to jesus or was she eternally lost because of a moment by a fire when a disciple lost his testimony. Now, don't get me wrong. Peter didn't lose his salvation. Peter goes on to become a great apostle of Jesus Christ. But in that moment, he lost his testimony. Just one slip up. Let me tell you, the world will never let you forget it. So if you're here, you're born again. Hey, don't worry your pretty little head about going to hell. But you might worry about causing someone else to go. 
Look at Luke 22, verse 31. Luke twenty-two thirty-one, 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. He said, but I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith fail not. Now watch this. And when thou art converted, strengthen your brethren. This is after the resurrection. What is Jesus saying to, to uh, Peter? He's saying, you're going to lose your testimony. I told you wrong. This was before the crucifixion. He said, but after when you're recommitted, when you're reconverted, then strengthen the rest of the disciples. Let me show you another, Mark 16, 7. After the resurrection, let's get it right. Go your way. This is Jesus talking to the women. After the resurrection, he told them, go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. This is the angel at the tomb. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. They didn't consider Peter a disciple. They wanted Peter to get the message, but they surrogated or separated Peter from the disciples. Why? Because a person that's denying Jesus is not considered a disciple. Was he still saved? Of course he was. Was he a disciple? No. Takes discipline to be a disciple. You can't lose your salvation. Peter didn't lose his salvation. But there are things you can lose. Don't worry about your salvation. But there are some things to worry about. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace, it's unmerited gift. It's an unmerited gift. In other words, you can't merit it. You can't do anything for it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and the faith is not of yourself. It's a gift of God. You don't have anything to do with it except receive it. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So don't worry about your salvation. It's a free gift. But there are some things to worry about. Number three, you can lose your joy. Now, a lot of people mistake joy for happiness, and, and a lot of people mistake joy uh, for fun. People exchange the joy of the Lord for the fun of the world. The Bible says sin is fun for a season. They always show the beautiful people, the most perfect people, drinking their alcohol. They never show them a few years later when the woman's puking all over her dress and her hair and she's driving that porcelain truck. They don't ever show that. Sin is fun for a season, but joy is a gift from God. In your greatest Gethsemane, you can still feel the joy of God. It keeps you. Look what David said in his worst day, Psalms 51, 12. He said this, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. The joy of God's salvation. God gives us joy. It's a gift of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are the fruits of of the spirit they are not your fruits that you conjure up they are the fruits that God produces in your life if you will allow him joy is one of them God gives us joy his joy it'll get you through the toughest times I can't explain it but I have experienced it John 15 11 Look what he says. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. That's Jesus speaking. And that your joy might be full. One of the things you can lose is your joy. Number four, you can lose your reward. 
Look at Matthew 16, 27. You can lose your reward. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now this is talking about every born-again believer will be rewarded according to his work. Do you have to work for salvation? No, you can't. There's nothing you can do. It's free. But after you're saved, you will be rewarded for how you handled the free gift of salvation. Did you keep it to yourself? Did you share it freely with other people? Did you experience and display the joy of the Lord? Did you have a good testimony before other men? Did you worry about what other people might say or think if they see how you live? Even though you had the secret within you that you couldn't lose your salvation, those other people don't have that secret. So when they see you do worse than what they do, they don't value your salvation. You can't lose it, but you can lose your reward. Fifth, you can lose your health. When you're born again, you're not guaranteed perfect health. I don't care what you hear on TV. When you're born again, you're promised some things. You don't get it all. You don't get the whole atonement when you're born again. If you've lost your foot uh, for whatever reason car wreck, battle, diabetes, doesn't matter, and then you're born again, you don't grow a new foot. You can lose your health. Paul, the apostle, was sick most of his whole Christian life. He constantly had a physician with him always. You are promised one day God will give you a glorified body just like his, but you don't get it all down here. Let me show you an example, just myself, not talking about you at all. I was not born a diabetic. I was not born, and when I, you know, the doctor raised me up, he said, oh, I'm sorry, um, mom and daddy, he's got that old sugar beetus. No, I wasn't born a diabetic. I did not catch sugar beetus from another diabetic. It's not contagious. I have sugar beetus because of my choices, my own personal choices. I am what the Bible calls reaping what I sowed. If you're born again, it fixes your eternal problems. Now, can God heal you? God's healed me a thousand times. But eventually, we're all going to pass. And one thing you can do, even though you're saved to the uttermost, you can hurry up your departure by the way you treat your body. You know, you just keep on drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking, and you're probably going to get some kind of cirrhosis of the liver. You just keep doing drugs and doing drugs and doing drugs. You just keep overeating and overeating and overeating. You just keep staying up late at night, not getting enough rest. Now, you can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your health. We could call Brother Kelly up here, and he, he could probably tell you some of the most outrageous stories of people that he's treated and the problem was self-inflicted. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Let's see what the Bible says. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. If you just defile this temple, 
God will destroy it. Number six, you can lose your life. I just cringe when people say, well, if it's my time to go. Now, does God know when you're going to go? Yes. Is there a certain uh, set time and date? No, I don't believe that. If you leave this church and you drive off the bridge out here because you was looking on your phone, that was not God's plan. Now, did God know it was going to happen? Yes, but that's not God's plan. If you would have put your phone down and been a safety, a real good driver like me, you wouldn't have went off the bridge. You could have lived a long time. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says you can, you can lengthen your life by just respecting and honoring your parents. Well, that doesn't mean that you got a certain day and you're going to die no matter what. If you'll take the biblical principles, your life can be lengthened. You can lose your whole life. One day becomes a week and then a week becomes a month and a month becomes a year and a year becomes a decade and before you know it, it's a whole life. I said that when I started to get to this point. It seems like I came here two weeks ago. When I came here, I had 1,500 weeks. I have about 540 now. If I live to the national average, what I'm trying to tell you is your life is fleeting it will soon pass. And you can turn around at the end of your life, the most precious thing that God gave you, and you've never done anything for Him. And you can be saved, and you don't have to worry about losing your salvation, but you should worry about losing your life. Time. It's the most precious thing God has gave us, but it's the first thing we'll waste. I led a man to the Lord. He was 91 years old several years ago. He told me it was the first time he'd ever heard the gospel. He lived in California, and he came to Barnesdale to visit some family. He was 91 years old. He just kept weeping and weeping and weeping. And I finally asked him, I said, are you okay? And uh, he said, I've wasted it all. I've wasted my whole life. What would you say to him? He was correct. And back then, I wasn't near as nice as I am now. And I said, yeah, you have. You sure have, sir. But you haven't wasted your eternity He didn't have much to be happy over except what he had looking forward to. And I tried to move his focus off of what he had wasted into eternity that he had gained. Look at Romans 8.13. Romans 8.13 For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of of the body you shall live. Now, I don't know how much time you have left, but don't waste a moment. Solomon, and I'm closing. Solomon is known in Christendom as the wisest man that ever lived. Well, you don't find that in the Bible. You didn't get that from the Bible. I believe he was the dumbest man that ever lived because Solomon had everything. And he wasted it all. God told Solomon, I'll give you anything you ask me for. He said, I want wisdom. God said, that was really wise to ask for that. Because with wisdom, you can gain anything. Also, with wisdom, you can uh, use it in vanity. Solomon took the wisdom of God and used it for himself. And he wrote a book called Ecclesiastics, and he tells you all about it. He wasted his whole life. He lived his whole life for himself. He was the king of Israel, God's chosen people. 
He was the tip of the spear. Everybody was looking to him, and he was the most terrible example that the Bible offers. Look what he says in Ecclesiastes 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, all throughout this book, Solomon calls himself a preacher. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. You know what vanity means? Worthless. Empty. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? At the end of his life, Solomon writes his whole life was wasted. He wasted his whole life for himself. He never lived for God. He lived for wisdom. And he found out that left him wanting. He lived for fame and wealth. And he had it all and still wasn't satisfied. He went in a period of his life after sexual pleasure and never was pleased. You say, why? Well, I've always been told he was the wisest man that ever lived. Well, let me tell you this. He had 300 wives and 700 sexual slaves. Does that sound like a very smart man? Go ahead, you can laugh. Just look right straight ahead. She ain't looking. He sought after a period of his life for authority. He got it. It left him wanting. So he went after wickedness. And he did the most wicked things he could think of. And still, it was empty. That's not the wisest man in this book. Here's what he wrote at the end of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, the last two verses. Let us hear the counsel, uh, conclusion of the whole matter. Here's what he come up with after his whole life. He lived for himself. He says, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Well, he never done it. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or or whether it be evil. I'm done. I want to leave you on this note. You only got one life. You only get one chance at it. Live it. It's going to end. And the only things that you did for Christ will last. At the end of your life. Would you be like Solomon? You say, hey, my life's empty. My life has no fulfillment. It doesn't have to be. Now, if you're here and you're born again, you don't have to worry about your salvation whatsoever. But there are some things that should worry you. Do I have assurance? Do I experience the joy of the Lord? What about my testimony to the people in my family first and then my friends and then my world? Am I a good example to them? Do I lead them to God or do I give them an occasion to sin? We're looking for the rapture of the church and the rapture of the church will happen and the Bible says that all of the Christian saints that are raptured unto Christ will stand before Christ at the beam of seat judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. Their sins will not be recorded. Their sins will not be brought up. But what you did after you received the greatest gift of salvation will. And you can suffer loss. 
You say, well, when I get there, I'm not going to care. I'm just going to be glad I got there, and I won't care. Yes, you will. I can assure you, you will. Stand to your feet. I thank you so much for coming. We're so glad that Lori and her sister, thank God for her sister. Everybody needs a good sister. I, I got three sisters. I only got one good one. I got four, but I only got one good one. And I'm thankful for her. And I'm thankful for you guys. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. God, we come as a church and we ask you to forgive us where we failed you. We thank you for the gift of salvation. But we ask you to forgive us where maybe we've taken it for granted. Where maybe we've just assumed that we deserved it. God, help us to live our life for you and not for ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks.